Hi, welcome everyone who's joined us today. I'm just going to give us one more minute for everyone else to join. Okay, and I think we can get started. Um, hello, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Stan Byrne, and I'm a volunteer at Made House. Tonight, we have a very special webinar featuring the creatives of In Seven Days. And we're going to be talking about death and dying and the relationship um, with art. But before we get to that very juicy discussion, uh, I'm going to do just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Nikki has kindly added the diversity statement, the Made House diversity statement to the chat. For those new to Made House, welcome. Uh, Made House is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing those eligible to receive MAID with a supportive and inclusive setting. We also provide resources and assistance for people who are supporting their loved ones through a MAID journey. And this webinar is a part of a series of webinars that we're doing um, along the theme of art for the soul. And you can read more about the work of MAID House at madehouse.ca. So I encourage everyone to use the chat for comments, um, for connecting with people uh, in the chat and in the webinar. Uh, we're going to leave some questions at the end, um, or some time, sorry, at the end for questions. If you can see the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, it should be at the bottom, might be at the top. And if you uh, have a question for Jordi or Philip today or during the discussion, then um, that will go straight to us and we'll take questions at the end. Um, a reminder that the chat is a public chat. So I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, a land acknowledgement uh, is not uh, just a recognition of, uh, of stolen land. It's also a way to recognize our, our place in history and to stand in deep appreciation for the land that we live, that we work, and that we play on. Um, as a virtual event, we probably span, span many different territories. Uh, I encourage you to add into the chat uh, where you're coming from. Um, as a host of this uh, meeting, I am in Toronto, and uh, that is on the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, Toronto is also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, um, and Toronto also contains unceded land, um, as well as being covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I encourage each and every one of you joining the webinar to learn about the history of the land that you're on, your place in that history, and take steps to caretake the land for the future. Oh, and that's amazing. I'm seeing already in the chat there's people from Calgary, Brampton. Thank you. Um, so I'm thrilled to be joined tonight by two of the most interesting and delightful people that I've had the pleasure of speaking to, uh, Jordi Mand, who is the writer of In Seven Days, and Philip Aiken, who is the director. So starting with Jordi, Jordi Mand is an award-winning writer known for her work in theater, film, and television. Her work has received global acclaim with translated and published plays uh, like Between the Sheets, Caught, This Will Be Excellent, Bronte, The World Without, and a new stage adaptation of the literary classic, Little Women. Mand was also a writer on the hit CTV drama Cardinal and has been a member of countless development rooms for Canadian television. Upcoming, she has new projects with the Stratford Festival and the Harold Green Jewish Theatre Company and an original TV series with Nishama Entertainment. Uh, and Philip. Philip is an acclaimed director and he has brought his award-winning direction to Canadian stages for over 25 years. He has also been a member of ACTRA since 1975. He is the co-founder of Obsidian Theatre, and he served as their artistic director from 2006 and to 2020, guiding the company with the philosophy of advocating for Black artists both uh, within the organization and uh, beyond the organization. Um, and he sits on the board of directors for Against the Grain Theatre, 
the Shaw Festival, and he is the Vice President of the Board for Canadian Contemporary Dance Theatre. So welcome to Philip and Jordy. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Hello, hello. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the things about tonight is this conversation kind of came about um, the Harold Green Theatre is hosting the Toronto premiere of In Seven Days on May 9th. And the proceeds for this opening night and the post-show reception um, are going in support of Made House. So this is sort of our virtual fireside pre-chat to that premiere. Um, and uh, Jordy has offered to, actually it's not true, I actually forced Jordy to read us an excerpt from the play just to start us off. Jordy, are you okay to do that? Absolutely. And you didn't force me at all. I think it's a really uh, brilliant idea because it's a bit hard to talk about something when you haven't really seen it or experienced it. So what I'm going to share with you is just a few minutes, basically, I want to say maybe 10 minutes into the show. We're literally on page 10. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to three of our five characters. And after um, I share this, it will be pretty clear why I decided to share it for this particular talk. So I'm going to introduce you to Rachel. She's in her mid-30s. She's the daughter of Sam, who's in his late 60s. And then we're also going to meet Shelly, who's in her early 40s, and she is Sam's partner. So Rachel has driven to her father's house, which is in, like a, in my mind, a smaller city outside of Toronto. Uh, because her father has asked her to come and spend the weekend there because he wants to talk to her about something. She doesn't know what it is. She shows up with a um, giant bag filled with bagels, which instantly rubs Shelly, Sam's partner, the wrong way because Rachel has brought the wrong kind of bagels uh, with her, which for, I feel like, Jewish communities is like a real no-no. And this is a Jewish family. So they have a lot of very funny back and forth about these bagels, about life. We get to see their dynamic. But we also see that Sam is really struggling to just sort of be in the room. He's struggling to stand up. And he finally works up the courage to talk to Rachel about what he wants to talk about. So I'm going to read all three characters. I'm going to try and differentiate all of them. I apologize if it's a little hard to tell who's who, but I think you'll get the gist of it. So Sam is dressed in an old sweatsuit. He's walking with two canes. He says, Rachela, sit. Sit. And Rachel says, what? What is it? Dad, you're freaking me out. I'm not. Well, is it your hip? Or that's part of it. But it's not. Um... I've been having some pain. And Shelly pipes in and says, some pain, some. He's in pain every day of his life. I've been having pain in my hips, my pelvis, my thighs. He's in so much pain, he can't get out of bed most days. He's exhausted. He's weak. He has no appetite. We went to see Dr. Powell. He ran some more tests. I've had a relapse. I'm out of remission. It's in my prostate. It's spreading. Rachel says, spreading where? Spread to my bones. Are they going to do more chemo? They're not sure. Not sure of, they're not sure how much of a difference it will make. Dad, it made a difference last time. It's worse than last time. Much, much worse. But you're still going to go through with any kind of treatment that they, they can't say for certain, but they're giving me a year. A year? A year to what? A year to live, Rachel, if I'm lucky. Likely closer to six months. No, Sam, they said six months to a year. But they're not sure. Right, Dad? They're not sure if they can't give me any kind of real timeline, but uh, it's not long. But it could be. It could be way longer than that. So many people live longer than the time their doctors give them, Dad. I still think you need a second opinion. She's right. You do. You absolutely do. You need to talk to someone else about, I already know what they're going to say. How could you possibly know, Dad? Because I've been to enough appointments over the years and seen enough doctors and had enough tests done to know that. But things have changed so much since the last time. Things are changing medically every day. I'm sure they'll be able to recommend some other option. Or, Rachel, you don't have many other options at my age. We should still look into it. I can make some calls. I can. It's no use. He's already made up his mind. Made up his mind not to get a second opinion. No. Made up his mind to... What? 
to what? Rachel, I'm tired. Do you want to go back to bed or it's not that kind of tired? I'm tired everywhere, all over. Every part of me hurts. I can't keep going on like this. I can't keep, but chemo would, I can't go through all that again. It was awful, absolutely awful. I can't go through with all of it, but they can give you something for the pain or the discomfort. They can, it's not about, I don't want to feel it, any of it. I don't want to feel anything. But there are medications they can give you for that. I can't go through it again. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means, it means, it means your father has decided to kill himself. Is she serious? Your father qualified. There's a doctor here who will do it. He's not very public about it. Even though it's legal, he's still very hush-hush about the whole thing. And of course, he isn't Jewish. Couldn't find anyone Jewish who would do it, but he seems very good at all of this. He can have it done here in the house. He doesn't even have to leave his bed if he doesn't want to. There's a time period though, right? Where you have to wait. You can't just do it. You have to wait a certain amount of time. And yes, you have to wait a certain number of weeks before you can move forward. Okay, so you have time. You have time to, he's doing it next week. Rachel, in seven days, he'll, he made the arrangements months ago. We're now past the point of, so yes, you should tell whoever you have to at work or at home that you're not going to be in the office on Monday or the rest of the week. And that sort of launches these three characters and two others, Eli, who is, um, the rabbi at the synagogue and Sam's longtime childhood friend, and Darren, who is Rachel's ex-boyfriend, sort of launches these five characters into the journey of the play that is in seven days. Jordy, um, I read the play and I was, I, I think I can see in the chat too, I was absolutely riveted. When you, <laughs> like you were just glued. Um, Already, I mean, I I read the play. I was so engrossed. I read it in one sitting, um, but just even just hearing the words, it, it just sort of popped right out. Beautiful. Um, I I wanted to know what was what what was the inspiration for the play? Was there something that you had been through or heard about? So for me, there was sort of um a thing and a conversation. I'll tell you about both. Okay. So um, my dad had a childhood best friend. They grew up together and kind of lost touch in the middle of years of life. And then about 10 years ago, my parents moved to London, Ontario. Hello to anyone who is joining us from London. And <laughs> so um, it. it turned out that this friend of his uh, had also moved there many moons ago and they reconnected and their friendship sort of started anew as uh, older adults. But um, his friend's health was, was really declining, and he had multiple illnesses and had gone through multiple rounds of chemo for various types of cancer, and he qualified for medical assisted death, and he decided to go through with it. And um, my dad's friend was Jewish. My family is Jewish. And as it's uh, sort of heavily discussed and debated in the play, medical assisted death is considered murder in Judaism. Judaism is a funny thing. There's so many ways in which Judaism has um, moved forward and has progressed on so many kinds of issues, but um, made is still considered murder. And so because my dad's friend was um, a major part of the, I would say, Jewish community in London, a lot of people got really involved and got involved in ways that really surprised me. You know, I don't know how many people are going to show up to my doorstep when I get to the later part of my life, we'll see, and tell me um, to or not to make certain decisions, but a lot of people um, in the community there uh, were very, very vocal about this decision that my dad's friend decided to, that he decided to pursue made and go forward with it. And so I was really, really fascinated about how this all played out. That was sort of the thing that happened. And then the conversation that to me was like, okay, this is a play, and this is the thing that I really want to be focusing on and exploring is I had been in London, and I had been seeing some of my parents. I came back to Toronto, and I saw my brother, who's a few years younger than me, and he said, how's mom and dad? And I said, you know, they're really struggling. They're struggling with the fact that their friend um, is ill and so ill that he qualifies for maid. And 
uh, that it looks like he's going to go through with it. And my brother, who I consider to be a really progressive person, said something along the lines of, I think it's the most selfish thing that someone could do. And I said, oh, that's really interesting you feel that way. So I was like, what if dad was, you know, was really, really sick yeah. and qualified for maid and, and wanted to go through with it? How would you feel about that? He said, my opinion wouldn't change. Um, I think I just don't understand how someone could do that and do that to their families. And while I understood completely where he was coming from, I feel the exact opposite. You know, I've had a lot of um, health issues in my own life and in my family's life. Illness and chronic illness is something that I feel has been a major part of my narrative as a human being. And so I understood really, really clearly why why somebody would um, would decide to pursue me. And so the fact that all of this was happening with my parents in this community and that my brother and I had such opposing views on this very particular issue, I was like, okay, there's, there's a play in there. And I started writing it almost immediately. What interests me is that it's such a, it's such a pivotal topic. And in such a short amount of time that Sam has, and possibly the person that was, um, that were the story that inspired the play, originally inspired the play, um, just even in that short amount of time, you know, we're grappling with these like deep conversations with people who may or may not agree with what's happening. And those conversations are philosophical and those conversations are personal and they're familial. They can even be political. Like it really spans so many things and the play really sums it up so beautifully. Um, Philip, I haven't heard from you. You uh, haven't asked me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jordy's doing beautifully. Yeah, uh, I know. I was, I was just ready to sit here for the whole time. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> so uh, when, did you, when did you become involved uh, in the play? And have you and Jordy worked together before? Uh, not in this capacity, no. Um, uh, she worked with me at Obsidian when I was there. And um, I've been lucky enough to read a number of her works over the, over the intervening years. And I've also done a lot of work with Harold Green Jewish Theatre. And we've had a, a really good relationship, bringing, bringing to the stage some very complex and challenging plays. And so when they called me up and said that the four of them had all decided that I should be the one to direct it, I said yes. Okay. So it's been a couple of years because there was a whole development period and workshops and casting and, and all of that. Um, and Jordi, have you written about death and dying before? And I guess the follow-up question to that is, did you receive any pushback or feedback from maybe your brother or friends and family who just didn't think you should write on the topic? I have written about death before. Mm -hmm. I've never gotten any pushback because I think all of the grappling and uh, exploring and examining of death in anything else that I've written before and in Seven Days is my sixth world premiere. Um, I think all the all of the deaths that I have looked at before have been fairly normal. You know, someone is, and when I say normal, I mean like in a someone passes away in a typical way that we imagine. They get old and they die. Um, and so this is the first time where the subject of death and the various ways in which it really complicates things for people, mm -hmm. uh, especially from a religious and spiritual standpoint and familial standpoint, all the standpoints that you'd mentioned before, um, that this is the first time that, it, that this is, it's really being looked at under a microscope. Uh, and the first time, you know, I've written a few, I've written, I wrote, an, as you mentioned, an adaptation of Little Women, There's Death in There. Um, I wrote uh, my imagining of the sort of uh, young adult to uh, older adult lives of the three Bronte sisters. Uh, one of them dies unexpectedly. But this is the first time that I've written about something that I think feels like it's really happening now in this time and place and feels mm -hmm. like it is about people that other people know. 
And so I think that has really changed things. But I was really, I mean, when I first said, told my parents uh, that I was thinking about writing about this, they were like, mm, I don't know. And of course, they've now seen the show more than I have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they read in London and, you know, they, uh, I think my dad has the entire script memorized. So uh, they definitely have come to see why it is such an important topic to explore and in this way. Um, and did you receive any like interesting feedback from the London premiere? I mean, because the, the, the town is in the play is kind of based on London. Yeah, in my mind, it is. It is London. It is the set doesn't look like my parents' home, but in my brain, it's set in my parents' home. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I think they're pretty happy to not see their exact. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Philip. <laughs> they were happy that it was a little bit removed. Um, it, it, you know, it's interesting. So on our closing day, uh, closing performance in London, there were protesters outside. There were anti-made protesters who came to um, stand outside the show. And I thought, it's so strange to do it on our closing day. If you really want to get some traction, you should come to our opening. But anyway, you know, that they're, they're on their own schedule. But uh, I sort of anticipated that. What I was so, uh, what really kind of filled my heart to the brim was how many people stayed to talk to me after performances to talk to me about their experience with MADE in a very, very positive way. So either, I mean, after one talk back, I, I started to lose count of how many people stayed back to talk to me about their experience and the generosity with which they were sharing very, very personal stories. Some people, you know, were sharing stories about parents who had gone through with MADE before it was legal. Um, some people shared stories about um, parents who are in palliative care and want to go through with MADE so badly, but for religious reasons can't. That was one of the really amazing things about the show is that, yes, it's a Jewish family, but the issues that are that exist within Judaism and within this family unit also are the experiences of lots of other religious and cultural groups right now. So it's okay. unique, but not unique. And, you know, lots of people opened up about their experience. Uh, or, you know, somebody said, you know, I think I would go through with something like this and I've never really said it out loud and sort of told me his whole life story. And as a writer, that's really the greatest gift because you hope that we never really know, I think, how our work and our art impact the people who experience it. But it, with this particular show, I think I've had a little bit of a taste of, of how this, these issues and this topic and the way in which we're inviting people into this world have impacted them. And it's been a really, really um, emotionally overwhelming experience in the best way possible. I have just been completely... Um, it's been a very heartful experience, people just sharing where they are at and what their experience with death is. And there's something about starting these conversations that really um, I find grounds me in the kind of very singularity of my life. Mm -hmm. Like just, I, you know, I know it's something that's going to come for me at one point. It's going to come for all of us. And yeah. um and and having those conversations it's like oh this is this is me right now like now i i, I have this life right now what am i going to do with it and um and what kind of connections am i going to make was there are there things that you for both of you this is a question for both of you are there things that you learned about made through the writing or the directing of this play that you didn't know before uh, everything I <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I would say that, um, you know, you have to you have to kind of do the research in the background to all of it. Um, but I also have to say that the the trap in any play like this is that people become stereotypes, right, mm. or archetypes. And and I don't believe in types as a as a character description. And so what has been written are these really well-rounded human beings who are all in their own way struggling to grapple with this. And they all have different responses because they're all coming. But, but because they're human, because it's nuanced, because they are not perfect, they're, because they're not strident cardboard characters, you know, yelling out their position, it profoundly touches the audience. 
and they fall into relating and identifying with people in such a strong way. I mean, there's a lot of people in tears in this show and laughing and crying at the same time. And that is, um, that's a pretty neat theatrical gift. Yes. From a maid standpoint, I knew, admittedly, I knew nothing really about the process before I started working on the show. And that's kind of, to me, one of the most interesting things about being a writer is that you have to become an expert on something very, very quickly. And so I talked to as many nurses and doctors who would talk to me. And I talked to as many rabbis who would talk to me because of the impact of how, just the, how it impacts um, a Jewish death, Jewish burial, Jewish everything. Because uh, that was very specific in terms of some of the struggles of the character was just how would making this decision change or impact um, Sam, the character who who goes through with Maid, how it, it would change his decision process and, and just the process in general. So it was really, really interesting um, learning all of the, as much as I could. And of course, there's still so much to learn about everything, but just learning about the technicalities both from a medical standpoint and from a religious standpoint. And from the rabbis that you talked to, were there were there rabbis that um, were supportive of me? So it's been a really it's been a mixed bag, actually. Mm -hmm. and so that's and so it's another interesting area. And one of the five characters in the play is a rabbi. And so part of the struggle that I witnessed in interviewing the people is definitely part of the struggle of Eli, who is um, not only the rabbi for this family, but also Sam's childhood friend. Um, you know, in different sectors of Judaism, it is changing in different ways. So if you are identify as a conservative or Orthodox Jew, it is really, really illegal. Um, it would be no different than talking about killing somebody else, murdering somebody else except you're murdering yourself. But in Reform Judaism, which is how I identify and my family identifies, and I think this is a Reform family in this play, which I would say, you know, is sort of more on the liberal, uh, lenient side of the religious spectrum. Um, it's, it is evolving. So there are some rabbis who are still not supportive of it, and there are lots of rabbis who are. One of the amazing gifts of working on the show was we had a, my rabbi, um, Rabbi Deborah Dressler, is, was the religious and cultural consultant on the show. And um, she's a, an amazing human being. And she, when I started working on the play, I interviewed her many, many times. And she said that, um, and this was before COVID, but she said that every year she went to something called rabbi camp, where <laughs> uh, in different but. parts of the world and there were rabbis from various sectors of Judaism that would get together and to come together over a period of days and they would usually go to an overnight camp during the off season and they would get together and they would talk about the challenges that their congregations were facing mm -hmm. and she said that in the last few years and now it's I think become a virtual thing because of COVID but um, she said that one of the largest and most contentious issues is is made because so many congregation members are um, getting older mm -hmm. and living longer and might be too ill to be in a nursing home and may not be quite in palliative care yet or may qualify for MAID and all of the issues that that raises from a religious and cultural standpoint. She said, you know, that it was like people couldn't talk about it enough. These rabbis just had so many questions for each other about how do we grapple with this? How do we do this? How do we support our congregation through these types of experiences? And what is my personal belief on it as a religious leader? And do I need to adapt to be able to support right. the people that I lead? And so I found all of that so, so, so fascinating because sort of going back to the beginning of this conversation, I think that, you know, very few of my day-to-day -day decisions uh, really impact a huge, huge group of people. Whereas for someone who's a rabbi or someone who is the leader of a religious or cultural group, the way you behave really does impact a large group of people. So it, I found that part of it really 
fascinating. And um, in Toronto, there's a number, the Harold Green Jewish Theatre Company has done an absolutely incredible job of organizing talkbacks. There's a talkback with religious leaders and um, doctors and hospital administrators. Like after every single show, there's just, an, let's just like incredible talk back after incredible talk back. And they have a number of them where we have rabbis from various religious groups or from, I would say, religious groups and Jewish sectors, what I mean by that is like we have a reform rabbi, a conservative rabbi, an orthodox rabbi coming in to talk about this. And so it's very interesting to me that this conversation gets to have this additional conversation after the show, which is really like, who is feeling what about this right now at this stage of time? Um, okay, so this is a really good moment to give a plug. Um, <laughs> The Harold Green Theater, so it's hgjewishtheater.com, uh, and you can find the link for, for tickets for In Seven Days um, on their website. You can also find it if you follow um, Madehouse Instagram, Madehouse TO, and we also have a link to, um, to purchase tickets for In Seven Days there as well. Um, so I think this question is a little, for both of you, really, um, but maybe, Philip, you could go first. So we spoke about this last week um, and uh, as I mentioned before at Made House we really feel strongly that engaging in these conversations about death and dying um, is so important. Um, why do you think it's uh, important to make art about death and dying and start those conversations like whether or not you are you have somebody who is has a terminal illness whether or not you're supporting somebody through Made. It's funny, um, I, I, a lot of times I feel like people uh, segregate the two things, death and dying or life and living. Mm. And they're really in synchronicity with each other because it may be one person who is, is, is hitting their time, but there's always people around who aren't yet. And so it's a it's a it's it's a tricky thing, right? It's a combination of things, and and the, the intense preparation um, that Sam has in the play about settling his affairs and having everything going is partly for him, but it's mostly for those who are going to be living. And I think I think the play is is mischaracterized if it's only seen through that one prism of death and dying. I think it's uh, life actually encompasses death. And so it's a, it's a play about life as well. And I, th I think if we don't embrace all of that, then we're missing half of the story. Good answer, Philip. Wow, eh? <laughs> just just came up with it. <laughs> nice. I feel too that Sandy sort of touched on this, but it always surprises me that given the fact we all know we're going to die, how hard it is for most people to really talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think going back to that conversation that I think about with my brother, about him saying that deciding to go through with mate is the most selfish thing he could imagine someone doing. I think that comes from not wanting to lose somebody that you love. And I think, you know, the more we love people, the harder it is, obviously, to see them leave. And so it's, for me, that's why it is so integral to talk about it, because I feel like we don't. Uh, I know so many people, like so many of my friends, have no idea what their parents' end of life wishes or desires are. Yes, yeah. And I think it's a bit crazy. Like, I, I think, and I've said, like, well, how do you, how do you not know? Like, why haven't you asked? And they're like, oh, I don't want to, I just can't go there. It's like, then when are you going to go there? <laughs> you know, like, like, like I, and I always, um, I guess I have been raised to be prepared, even though, you know, certainly after living through a global pandemic, it's pretty clear you can't be prepared for anything. But I think, you know, death is already... Death and the idea of living without somebody that you love is already so hard and so painful that to not um, 
be prepared for some aspects of it, I think ahead of time, as much as one can be, feels a bit bonkers to me. And yet it is so taboo to talk about death. Yeah. And, you know, I have a three and a half year old and we drove, my husband and I drove by a cemetery recently and she asked us, you know, she said, what are those stones? And she was referring to gravestones. We were just driving by and I was like, oh, I don't know if we should tell her what they are. And I was like, what? What am I, what am I waiting for? You know, <laughs> you know, like, it is my responsibility to introduce this little person into what the world is and what the world means. And, you know, here I am like, oh, I don't want her to know that you lose people you love. And I, I already see the instinct in myself, you know, trying to protect her from the pain mm. and, and just the awfulness of losing somebody. And, uh, and yet it's going to happen. So, I, you know, I just think death is... Uh, and everything Philip's saying is, is absolutely right. Like we've been saying so much that this play is really about living. But I think in terms of why it's important to make art about death and dying, it's because we just don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, at least in Western society, like it just feels like it's so, we try to, we try not to look at it as much as possible. And I think that there is sort of nothing more powerful than being with a group of people looking at it together. I wonder, I wonder if it's also we have a, a society which um, um, can be willfully blind. Um, I, I look at other societies and they have a much different engagement with what life and what death means. Mm. And um, my, my daughter was on a, a trip, I think it was in Togo, and uh, somebody she knew back in Canada died and she was very upset right? Very, very upset. And the people she was staying with, they're just like, okay, yeah. And she was, she was like devastated that, that they didn't. And, and I said, they probably they have a very, they have a very different relationship. It's, it's, and I think we tend to um, kind of silo ourselves. And the reason you don't talk about end of life matters is because if you don't talk about it, it won't happen to you, right? Yes. I think that's the that's the thinking, and which is ridiculous and pointless, but it also manifests its way through the rest of our relationships. So we avoid, 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 and it'll happen to those guys, but it won't happen to me, um, which is folly. Hmm. Um. You talked about this a little bit, Jordy, um, and you touched on it, is that, I mean, both with your daughter and also, you know, with your parents or talking to older people, there's an interesting thing in the play about intergenerational conversations around death and dying. Um, do you find that there's, like, I, I realize you're, you're probably, like, you and Philip are probably kind of outliers on this, but um, do you find that there's a difference about how people for example your age speak about death and dying as opposed to people who are sam or eli's age in the play um or maybe even shelly's age if she's in her 40s i think yeah and i have to say not to call you out philip but all the mm -hmm. things about us even philip and i um have very differing Maybe it's closer now that we worked on the show together, but differing perspectives on all of this. Okay, so, interesting. Let's get into it. Oh, man. <laughs> like, wow. Like, Philip, how many times have I grilled you and been like, please tell me that your will is done? How many times has the sun <laughs> risen? <laughs> Always. So, like, I would, I think, traditionally, and anyone in the chat, please feel free to pipe in if you have a different or exact opinion. And if you agree with me, I'll love you even more. <laughs> I think people would assume that someone my age, I'm in my late thirties would have less of a focus or less um, or find it harder to talk about death because we don't want to lose, you know, parents, grandparents, um, it's, it seems further away, like what Philip was saying that, you know, it's not going to happen to me, but might happen to other people. And that maybe as you get closer to a later stage in life, one might 
come to terms with things differently and you might not necessarily be more comfortable, but just at a different stage of acceptance. And this situation is totally different. And I think that so much of that has to do with um, who you are, where you come from, but also when death entered your life, um, either as a child or as an adult. So a little bit more about me, everyone. So when I, Dan, I can't remember if I shared this with you. I probably did when you and I had a chance to chat, and that was such a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it so much. Um, when I was in high school, my mom had a real had like a life altering stroke, and so I thought I felt like, and pardon my French, that shit got real real quick for me. Um, and I was pulled into my parents' um, financial and medical affairs very quickly. So you know, I was told. This is where, you know, in case, break in case of emergency, here's where the will's located, you're, here's when you become your brother's legal guardian, here's who you call about, you know, anything related to the estate, here's when it becomes your responsibility. And just like very early on, I understood that, um, A, this happens, that things can change very quickly for people, that um, it, that there is grace and elegance in being prepared. And in some ways, and I say this a lot, and I really mean it as a compliment, my parents weren't able to join tonight, but I wish they could so I could just call them out publicly. It's one of my favorite things to do. But you can send them this recording. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> I, my, in, in some ways, I feel like my parents, and my mom especially, who was the one that had this major health crisis, um, in some ways, I feel like my parents have been preparing to die for decades. And what that means is I, in my late 30s, and for the last uh, however many years, have known exactly what my parents' wishes are. Um, every few years, they kind of redo things, and they tell me and my brother what's going on. My brother does not want to listen to it, and I'm always, like, taking copious notes. You know, I know exactly what medications my parents take. Um, you know, like, I know I'm as much as they have worked they've worked so hard as much as they have worked to make things as clear and useful for for us as possible i have all that information available to me and so i think that's rare uh, i think my parents are actually outliers um in the last five years most of my friends have lost one or both parents and by the time funerals had to happen or wills were looked at, or executors were brought in, or whatever. Um, there was nothing but chaos and confusion mixed in with the grief and guilt that is losing somebody that you love. And so I feel like in a way I'm not the right person to ask because I have such a fascination with how badly human beings deal with all of this. But I would say traditionally, from what I'm experiencing, the people that are my age or younger, or even a little bit older. So the Rachels and the Shelleys and the Darrens of the world. Darren is Rachel's ex-boyfriend who enters the play about halfway through. Um, they are less prepared and certainly emotionally less prepared. And that Sam, the beauty of Sam as a character, the character who decides to go through with Dade, is that he is really prepared and has gone above and beyond to make this process as easy as possible for the people around him. And, and that's really important for me, but I don't think that's important for a lot of other people my age. Philip, I'll pass it over to you. Oh, no, 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 I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is a no win situation for me. So let's move on to the next question. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to ask you a question then. Um, the actors uh, that you worked with, did they have any concerns about being involved in a play about Maid? No, they didn't. Um, I, I mean, you know, good actors are good actors they're 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 they spend their lives being not who they are in in a sense uh i i do think though that the weight of the play was surprising um because there is humor in it and there's you know and, and 
and I have a tendency when directing um, and there's comedy in it is we don't actually talk about the jokes like we don't set up jokes in rehearsal and it all I always go for the for the depth and the foundation and so when you get to a preview all of a sudden there's laughter coming with in the right okay. way at the right time then they have to do an adjust I will also say, though, I mean, a standard theater week is six days, you know, um, eight hours a day, six days a week. And we didn't do a six day week on this. Um, okay. It was by time we got to to Saturday, um, everybody in the room was crunched. I had, there were four people on the stage management side, myself, an assistant director and the actors, and everybody needed two full days off just to just to breathe just to exhale so it was that was the most difficult thing and i i tried to um open up areas where uh actors have to be brave in right like there's some very difficult moments in the play and i would say that one of the things that I try to do is, you know, the endings of plays are where, you know, the big power packed moments come. And I don't really actually believe in rehearsing the endings of plays until into your third week of rehearsal. Because I say you can't know the ending until you know what comes before. And so when we finally got to do the last two scenes of the play, it was incredibly powerful, incredibly difficult. Um, and, you know, the actors are troopers. They go through, we finish the show, they cry, they mm -hmm. hug each other, they take a beat, you know, a couple of big breaths, go to the bathroom, come back and get notes. So it's, it's a process. Um, and I, you mentioned it a little bit about the, because it, reading the play, and I, I didn't see the premiere in London, mm -hmm. but reading the play, there's some some big tonal shifts, like between, um, and even just hearing Jordy talk about it, like the there's anger, there's grief, there's sadness, and there's also an incredible amount of levity. How do you, as a director, kind of juggle all of those moments so that it's not, you know, as you said, it's not just a play about death. It's also a play about life. And yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 about there. Oftentimes you get a scene in a play and there's an obvious way to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's especially if it's a well written play like this one is it, it, it's like an obvious way to do it. And then so I look at um, respecting what's written. Uh, Jordy works in in a lot number of fragmented sentences, and you have to build what what is why are people's sentences stopping, and the rhythm that that creates builds a musical score underneath the words, and so you have to discover that, and you base that on on as I said earlier on real people, and so you just open up the space and say, this is where we have to go emotionally. And good actors will be brave and will be courageous and will will go there. Uh, so, you know, that's that's part of how I how I work. And and we've got a fantastic cast. You know, they're 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 great. They're open, they're caring, they're hugely supportive and uh, hugely supportive of each other. And I think that's what has has lifted the play up to a really excellent level. And it's the same cast. It's the same Toronto. cast coming to Toronto as well. Yeah, it better be. I, we, we've only got like <laughs> about three, four days to get it back up. So, <laughs> yes, it's the same cast. Um, is there anything that you're uh, in particular looking forward to in the Toronto run? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess I am. I, there's a, there's a thing, I mean, English is a hierarchical language, right? So if there's one and then there's two, or there's A and then there's B. And, and if you get the two or the B, you kind of feel cheated because you didn't get the A or the one, right? Yeah. Okay. So 
Um, I have a longer story to go with that, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> you can tell me later. <laughs> so, uh, but what I think we have done is we found solution A to a number of the issues throughout the play. And when you get to do a remount, it gives you the luxury to go and look for solution ones. Interesting. So that we have, yes, we can say, I can say, look, yeah, we've got this moment. We've got it cracked. It's great. So we've got that in our back pocket. We can always go back to that. But what happens if this, what happens if we try, what, what, what does that change the musicality? How does that change downstream the moment, you know, 25 pages on? And we have an opportunity on a remount to, to play in subtle ways to incorporate what they have learned during the run, because I wasn't there. So I will see things that they have discovered in ways they have grown, and then we'll all piece it back together so that it, it's the way that um, I think it should be. Jordi, are you looking forward to anything in particular in the Toronto run? I'm just looking forward to, to diving back in. It's such a rare opportunity to be able to, to revisit a story and a play and characters um, so soon after kind of discovering them and, and meeting them for the first time. And um, I saw a number of performances of the show in London, and each time the cast, who are phenomenal, just went deeper and deeper in the work. And um, and it was it was it was a real treat to see them figuring things out uh, every single time. So I'm I'm just excited to to keep going together. Good. And are your parents coming to the Toronto premiere? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the most important question. Okay. Most important question. <laughs> You'll meet them on opening product. night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a, a, the family affair continues. They will okay. put bells on. <laughs> okay, sweet. All right, um, I'm conscious of time, so I want to make sure I get to the questions um, that the audience have posed in the Q&A. Um, okay, so first up, is any plans uh, for the play to come to Vancouver? Ooh, um, we are looking at possible lives in a number of places, uh, in a number of countries for the show. So uh, I hope that this, this little piece of ours has a much longer life than anything we could have dreamed of. OK, so maybe, possibly. OK. Uh, this is actually very similar. Um, so will you be taking the play on the road? Will you be coming to Montreal? So you already have all these invitations. <laughs> um, have you considered a translation into French? Uh, I, you know, almost all of my plays have been translated into multiple languages. Uh, and, and I love that experience. So uh, I hope this is translated into every language possible. And I hope that it gets I hope that the show happens in every place that is not Toronto and London that people are joining us from. Amazing. Um, somebody asked if the script would be publicly accessible. Mm. Uh, it's going to be published uh, at a later time, but if uh, you buy a ticket to come and see the show, then um, I will find a way to get you a copy of script okay a script, a script which by the way she just did revisions for the toronto run just so that you know you know went in and cracked open a few a few pieces and uh clarified some stuff that she learned from the run um to sort of refine it for the toronto version it's a, it's a work in progress we're all just a work in progress so it's a it's a living document i love yeah. that yeah, yeah, it is. It's living and breathing just like we are. <laughs> um, so this next question is from um, uh, Miriam. I'm very concerned about the federal government's decision to postpone and possibly cancel a MAID for people living with mental illness. Would either of you be interested in creating an artistic contribution that deals with this related issue? I think I would be interested in creating an artistic expression 
about anything and everything, to be honest. Mm. Um, I don't think there's any topic that isn't worth exploring. Uh, whether that will be my next piece or not, I don't know. But I am also concerned. And uh, I'm really, really curious to see how it starts changing conversations around me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have one final, which is, uh, I'd love a script for a small community theater companies to educate communities and increase conversations. So that's another uh, little shout out to, you have to take the show on the road. And <laughs> many places as you possibly can can i can i can i say at this point too it's very easy uh for people to um agendize art right and and put together something that states your point of view so that you're right and everybody who doesn't agree with you is wrong and I don't think that that's what this play does in any way, shape, or form. And I don't think that that is actually really good art. And I think what's good art about this piece is the fact that it's people struggling with things in their own way. And many different viewpoints are brought up. Mm -hmm. And then not from a place of right, wrong, it's a, from a place of I care, I feel how and and how do we how do we find our way together to that moment where they hold hands at the end? How do you find that way forward? And and so I'm not interested in agenda theater. I am interested in in rich, nuanced people's lives, which which bring forward. Uh, uh, a slice of our humanity. I think that's a, a amazing point, and we talked about that. I think on when we chatted, Philip, just that the play is so rich in terms of uh, point of view, and mm -hmm. and it, it's not it's not the point that the, the play has a point. It's that it it has so many different points of view, and I really feel like anybody who watches it can. Um, no matter what their point of view can really relate to at least one person or one character within the yeah. play. I mean, to me, it's brilliant that, I mean, Rachel struggles against this and I hope this isn't a spoiler, but she struggles against it for the entire play. Right. It's not like everybody finds, you know, a waltz through the daisies at the end. It's yeah. like she, she fights her corner the whole play. I love that. I think it's so honest and true. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you. Jordi, is there anything else you want to say before I wrap up? Come see the show. If you yeah. live in Toronto, come and see it. We would love for you to be there. If you are there on an evening where I'm there or Philip's there, please come and say hello. Um, we will figure out how to get a script to all of you who can't be there, if you are interested, I don't know if there's a way maybe for Madehouse to be able to contact Madehouse and then- Yeah, like, absolutely. Can absolutely. The logistics of that. Um, but come and uh, come with an open mind and an open heart and um, and thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you to, to Tecla, who's the wonderful ED of, um, of Madehouse and she helped put this together. Um, thank you to Harold Green Jewish Theatre for this collaboration. Um, thank you to Blair and Nikki who are working the webinar behind the scenes. Um, Blair is the chair of the communications committee and Nikki is our comms professional. Um, a really deep bow of gratitude to you, Jordi and Philip for your incredible work, um, for your bravery, for your insight, for this conversation. Um, and just starting the conversation about MAID and the impact on, on families and, and loved ones. And lastly, thank you so much to everybody watching um, for commenting in the chat. I just love how like just off the chat went. It was amazing just from the very beginning. Um, we wouldn't we wouldn't do these regular webinars without you and without this type of engagement. And the more we talk about life and death, um, 
the the more we can really uh, make safer spaces and destigmatize the conversation. So thank you everyone for commenting and listening today. Um, when I end the webinar, there'll be a survey that'll pop up. So please just take a moment to, um, to fill in the survey and let us know if there's anything that you would uh, like to see for future events. And so we'll see you at the play May 9th. Thank you so much.